and uh, welcome to episode number 12 of the After Hours Podcast. Um, here with me today, I have the or I have a member of the, the social media chair for Ohio State's eSports program, um, James Ritzy Bevins. Thanks for, thanks for coming on. I think this should be a, a pretty fun one. This is going to be slightly different than the normal interview style. I think we're going to just kind of have a good conversation. Um, so I'm pretty excited about this. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I've been following Sector 6 for a little bit now, among all the other apparel companies that show up in esports. But yeah, I'm just looking forward to kind of picking your brain as you pick mine as well. Cool. Um, so I do know a couple of things that we had pr- previously discussed about um, a couple topics. Um, I guess the, the, the most easily transitionable into would be the the collegiate esports space. Um, so obviously you spend some time in the collegiate esports space. Uh, unfortunately, I, I did not. Um, like f- at college, I guess is the best what I'm trying to get at. Um, so what is what does that typically look like? And what's the difference that you think um, between collegiate esports like on campus versus, uh, you know, like what you would see a standard esports organization um, what are the differences in like the way they ran and, you know, the whole structure and, you know, things like that? Yeah. So, um, most importantly, I would note that esports in a lot of colleges is like very new. Um, like for Ohio state, we're actually in a transition period right now. It's going from a club to an actual program that the university is backing. But once cool. it gets to that stage, I know, uh, Maryville along with a lot of the other colleges in that have uh, league legends teams they're to that point where they're ready to offer scholarships and such um but compared to like regular esports or like you know organizations like optic hunter thieves the main names it's it's different in the sense that the skill isn't as high these the orgs that are already established like a couple of ones that i named they already have they already have the best players. They've already taken the best pool of Call of Duty players. And it is it is hard for universities because you have to get essentially top-the-line gamers that are attending your school. Um, and of course, gaming being mainly online, it's pretty hard to recruit someone across a couple of states to join your esports program while he's doing much more than that. He's also joining your school and he's choosing to get a degree from your college. Um, uh, what was, what was the, one of the other questions that you mentioned? Um, just the, the structure as a whole. So like, I guess from a public perspective, there's, or it's probably not true anymore, but most, I guess, amateur I'm comparing to here. Um, the structure isn't as, I guess, corporate or, um, as built out as you would see at the, at the higher level, like the, the, the big dogs, like the ones you mentioned earlier and yeah. so on. And, but, but the more amateur level ones, where's the difference in, um, or what kind of separates collegiate esports programs from, from those guys? So I would put as far as like how they're structured collegiate esports, the, the schools that have actual established programs for esports right now, they're yeah. just as professional, if not maybe more professional than the top organizations like your optics, your phase, your team liquid, because they have the university backed behind it, they have program directors and basically they have someone from the school or someone that they've hired on to the school to cover every position that you would need to run an organization. Right. And in my eyes, uh, the amateur scene, as far as esports organizations go, is is a whole like there's a whole big gap between an amateur organization and an organization that has some teams that have placed, you know, inside top eight or even better than that. Yeah. Um, I just, so comparing amateur teams, organizations to college, there's still a lot of catching up to do. Something mm-hmm. that has become apparent um, is that a lot of these schools that are starting to put esports programs within their uh, curriculum, they, they are getting people who know what they're talking about in business and they're getting people who have a lot of history underneath their belts or maybe even starting up other programs at schools. But these people might not be as familiar with the esports scene directly. 
Um, and that's something that I notice a lot of in the industry is there's a lot of really young kids, like 15, 16 years old, who love esports. It's their passion, but they don't know the business side of things yet. And then mm-hmm. on the other end, there's a lot of people who have been in corporate for 10 plus years now. You know, they're in their 30s, their 40s, even older. And they see esports as a money making machine, which it can be, but they don't understand the esports side of things. They only bring the business side of things. Right. So it's just, and it, it's an interesting space right now being a college student having interest for esports because you're kind of in the middle where you're starting to learn all the things that you need to know to actually run a business because that's what it is at the end of the day. And you're also, you've been involved with the esports industry already. Um, at least in my case, I've I've been following competitive gaming probably since Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. Yeah. That's a good amount of time. Um, so now, um, what, what year are you in your, your college? What year of college are you in? Uh, I'm heading oh, into my... Work. I'm heading into my senior year. Okay. Okay. Um, and now how long has Ohio, has Ohio state had an esports program? Is this the second year or going into the second year or third year? So Maybe we're actually going point? into the first year for the university to be in charge of it. Um, oh, right. right, right. Have, okay. Before it was like a yeah. club, right? Okay. So yeah, up until now it was technically considered a club. Of course there was like a, member from Ohio State's faculty who had to be in charge of it overall. But for the most part, it was ran completely by students. So we're kind of in an awkward transition phase of trying to get people who are in the club to be a part of the actual program, as well as leave it open to new people. Um, but starting starting this semester, as long as it's not behind Ohio State's opening up in a 80 station building, essentially, a little arena that's going to have broadcast boots, VR, all the consoles, PCs, everything you need to start your career off. Now that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, sounds like a lot of fun. Now, um, what is the, we got into this a little bit before, or you got into this a little bit before when you mentioned that the, the big dogs, the established professional organizations already have like all the, the top talent uh, and the school has to work with us on their campus. What does that recruitment process kind of look like for, for the school and like, how does, how does the school incentivize a a potential candidate to to come to their school? Is it similar to like how you would see uh, football on campus or or things like that? Yeah. So this is something that I'm not quite as familiar with just because Ohio state hasn't really started that process yet. Um, I know that a lot of these colleges, probably all of the esports competitive teams are going to be completely on scholarship. But as far as, you know, how do they recruit players? Um, Cause there's not an established league before college that that is pretty interesting to think about. Um, and that's one thing that I'm actually not sure what they plan on doing for that. Hmm. That is, that's that I kind of wanted to touch on this a little bit because it would make sense in other sports, which a lot of people want to treat esports just like other sports. Yeah. You have your high school level basketball team, your middle school level basketball team and so on. But so far, the only thing that we're establishing right now is college esports. Yeah. There's nothing. I've seen a few high schools coming out with like some clubs and stuff, but I haven't seen any super organized high school leagues. Um, I was actually so, wondering. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, the, so there is some high school leagues. Uh, I don't, there's probably, they're probably, they could be done better. I would say like without throwing shade or anything at any particular league, but there's, um, there's leagues that are in this space. There's a a handful of them. Um, we've worked with a couple of them. Um, but what, what I think is lacking is like, I don't know. I, I think I think when the high school's kind of leagues came into the space, they went too broad. I think what it should be is similar to the way, like you mentioned, middle school basketball or football or whatever baseball is going to be ran, where it's more um, like it's in the same kind of league as the way you have your football team. So you have the eight to t- 
12 teams that you play on a football season at, at the middle school level, it should be the same with the esports program. Because uh, at this point, a lot of schools have an esports club or program at the high school level. Um, it just might not be big enough that they're that they want to, you know, push it to that next level. But once everybody gets there, it it should be ran like that, and then grown out from there. Um, I don't know. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, or if um, if you had that at, at your high school. Because I know for me, right after I graduated, they started to put that together. Um, at my high school, they still haven't put anything in place, but I definitely agree with a lot of what you're saying, um, if not all of it. It's 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 something that's going to be a lot harder than for colleges to implement, I would say, but it would help a lot in the recruitment process because once you get to the college level, you are able to receive scholarships. Um, yeah. And there's only so many ways that people can prove themselves to being, you know, worthy of a college scholarship for esports when there's no league below you that's established. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the way the esports kind of community and, and industry as a whole blew up, it, it definitely blew up from the top down. Um, and you had your, your big dogs who had the money who, and at the time were not that big of big dogs and didn't have that much money, but they came in and, Obviously, they're where they're at now, but they came in and they were able to send these players to events and, you know, they did it right and uh, everything was done right. But at that point, it was just done at the top. And then it started to make sense that a collegiate program is built and then it starts to make sense that a high school program is built and like the whole trickle down theory. Um, you know, I think I think it'll get there. Um, it's just going to be a matter of time. Like we we are we're only two years past esports and game like maybe not gaming but esports being as mainstream as it is now yeah i think you know as as time goes on it'll become more normal you won't have people like alex rodriguez saying that esports is, is ridiculous i don't know if you saw that yesterday yeah, i did uh but uh, unfortunate that alex rodriguez was somebody that i looked up to as a child and now <laughs> He is not on board, and he also is an investor in an esports organization, which I find very interesting. Um, yeah, mildly the, unfortunate. <laughs> there's starting to be a good a good thread of people who don't know what they're talking about when they're talking on the news or whatever. It may be a baseball game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure it'll come around, just like ev- everything else. You know, what was it? Um, like rap wasn't really super mainstream in the beginning. People didn't really like it. Um, I think we just cut out there for a sec. That's oh, okay. Uh, but but rap wasn't super mainstream. You know, people weren't super big fans of it, and and now it's definitely you know mainstream to say the least. Um, right. You know, things like that. It grows over time. Um, so I don't. I don't know. I'm not too concerned. Should be fine. Yeah. Um, while we were touching on. High school and college esports. Uh, if you wouldn't mind me bringing up a new topic that's related yeah, to that, uh, how and you're probably better to speak on this than I am. How would you go about if you were starting? You know, if you lost your job tomorrow, how would you go about getting into esports, getting another opportunity? And if you weren't doing what you were doing, where else would you want to be in esports? Yeah. So the thing with esports, or uh, I, I can't speak on this for everything, but I'm assuming it's very similar in in any industry. Um, but it's a lot of mm, it's a lot of putting yourself in the right situation as many times as you possibly can. So if, for example, if you take what I do or did and apply it anywhere else, whether it was um, so so before this, I, I did graphic design and I did just freelance. It was nothing too, too big. Um, but if I was a graphic designer and I wanted to work in, um, in cartoon building or however, whatever wording, however you were that mm-hmm. I wanted to make cartoons, I would just be at every single day. I'd be drawing up a new storyboard or a new, um, what's it called? Like a, like a new comic or whatever. I, 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 um, wow, I'm struggling. Uh, a first issue, whatever, and send it to as many people as I can, as many people as I get my hands on. Mm-hmm. Um, but so theoretically, you know, eventually you'll get a bite. So in, in the esports scenario, depending on what you want to do in esports, whether it's graphic design or marketing or player management or whatever it is, or coaching, um, cause coaching is getting really big. 
Um, I would just be putting together, you know, whatever that skill set is and getting tangible, um, you know, experience together for that and sending it over to, to whoever you're going to potentially work with. Offer your services for free because, um, I mean, depending on who you ask, offering services for free is not necessarily, quote unquote, a good thing, but it gets you to build relationships. Yeah. Um, some of the best relationships I have were built off um, doing graphic design for free or building friendships that I have through graphic design. Uh, Mitchell, who is the, our jersey designer, I met through graphic design and, and Mitch is probably what one of my best friends at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, we work together and all that. Um, but you know, it, it's all about bet- putting yourself in the situation or the potential situation to succeed. Um, and eventually, the luck comes around that you're going to get somebody who's going to give you a job or connect you with somebody who's going to give you a job or whatever it is. All, all it is is building enough connections to get to the point where you could just be like, this, this is the right move and, and I'm ready to make that move. Um, obviously it's a little harder. It's a little easier to push yourself into that situation when you have no job. But the hardest part is, um, finding a job when you already have a job because you don't have the motivation or the motivation isn't as strong, ironically enough. Right. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, just putting yourself out there is probably the, the best way to do that. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, my thoughts on it. Networking is definitely super important inside esports. Almost. hundred percent. Almost everyone can be tied to someone by like five mutual friends. Like yeah. It's we're, we're all overall pretty tight knit community. Um, so just get to know more and more people. And, you know, I haven't had a plethora of esports jobs. I've had two now I'm working to get another one. Um, also just focusing on school, but working for free is something that I've done. And honestly, Obviously, you would rather get a paid position, but I think working for free is super smart because you have a lot better chance of getting maybe a more recognizable organization or company to let you work for them if you are offering a free service for them. Exactly. Uh, and if you are really you know, confident in your skills or whatever you may bring to the table and you work hard while you're working for free for a couple weeks, if they like you, they will bring you on and they will start to pay you. Like it's working for free is a good way to open up opportunities that might not have been open beforehand, especially if you don't quite have the qualifications that other people might have. Yeah. Um, And make sure if you are like cold, cold calling or emailing companies um, saying, you know, do you guys need any positions filled? I'm willing to work for free, whatever your pitch is, make sure you tell them in that email what exactly you can do to help their organization because they get emails from people who are willing to work for free even all the time, especially with the growth that esports is going through. And you're not going to get a second look at unless you tell them exactly what you can offer and bring to the table for their organization or for their company. Yeah, I agree. I think, I mean, the most important thing is value. Um, You know, whether that's a paycheck or, you know, um, building a connection base or obviously the value that you're bringing them. Cause at the end of the day, if you're going to work for free, you want to work for free cause there's that clout or that, um, that notoriety of working with that organization, or there's the paycheck that's involved with working with that organization, or there's the, the connections that the, the guy in charge over there has that, that are going to help you get to your next step. And on the, on the other side, what do you, what is that organization going to value from you? Um, so if you're going to come in and you're going to be a social media guru, or a marketing expert, and you're going to be able to double their sales, or you're going to be able to double their their um, their engagement rate on their tweets, or or their Instagram, or whatever it ends up being. The, you know that's definitely should be mentioned up front, especially if that's your um, your goal in, in working with them. And you know, obviously, I think that the biggest the biggest thing here is it's a trade of value, whether it's monetary or it's uh, connection based, or you know who's going to talk to who, or whatever it ends up being. But value is definitely the key here. Yeah, also with with how many people are trying to get into esports jobs, um you just you got to put yourself out there and just show them why you are better than the other candidates and working for free automatically puts a leg up on the competition, or at least most of them. Um and just 
apply to as many jobs as you can. I know I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with hit marker jobs, but there's other websites as well as, you know, LinkedIn, whatever, Indeed, where there's a lot of esports postings every single day. Even if you think you might not be 100% qualified, but you're close, I would still apply, make sure you have a good cover letter every time. Um, And it's super important to build your resume with anything that you can in esports right now, just because of how many positions are being filled so fast. Just getting yeah. anything under your belt that's esports related will help you other than, you know, working at your local grocery store, for example. Yeah. I will say as somebody who gets a decent amount, eh, we don't get a lot, but I get a fair amount of resumes and cover letters and things like that. It's, it's not super important to include that you're familiar with or proficient in Microsoft Word or Excel. Like at this point, it's kind of assumed. Yeah. Um, and if, if you can't make a basic document, you probably don't belong applying. Um, but I guess that's just my two cents. I don't know if that's kind of arrogant or not, but... Uh, no, I mean, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. It's, I, I mean, as of, like, I totally get that too because on some of these re- resume builder websites, they'll have, like, um, certain words that you can just autofill in, like the website will automatically fill them in for you, and they always have, like... Yeah proficient in excel and i mean i guess if you are an expert in excel that brings a lot more to the table than anything with word or like google documents or something like that but yeah that's like if you're if you're if you're looking to be an accountant and you're saying proficient in excel that's probably a a requirement um or if you're going to be a a writer um and you're going to say that you're proficient in word or whatever document you're going to use that makes sense because you're using that in every you know day-to-day kind of operations uh but anybody could open up a word document and write basically what they want to write it's not necessary for a in my opinion it's not necessary for a um you know a a team support coordinator or someone or a social media um, coordinator to, to necessarily have those skills at the, at the capacity that an accountant would have, you know, cause it's, it's at the end of the day, it's just more of a, a, a those are doers jobs and, you know, the, having the, the, the drive to, to get the job done on, on that side is a little bit more important than just being able to open an Excel document in my opinion. <laughs> Yeah, and it also does kind of make you seem a little uncertain of your own skills because if you have like eight skills listed and one of them is that you're good with Microsoft Word, that kind of says something. If you're putting that as one of your top skills, like yeah, there, yeah there's I, just I there's mean, a lot of other skills that you could fill there that would look a lot better and sound a lot better for yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's more of a it's more of a filler. I mean, I've used it before too, because I, I, prior to um, being in esports, I worked in retail and I hated my job every other week. And I was always putting together a resume to send out um, to try and get a new job and, and all that jazz. Uh, and I always put that proficient in Word. And it's just a, it, it makes your resume look bigger. But at the same time, it does, it's all the fluff when you just want meat and potatoes. And I guess I never knew it um, prior to or then because I'd never had accepted a resume. So I didn't know what I was looking for and I didn't know what mattered. Mm -hmm. Um, But meat and potatoes, I'd rather a half page resume over a page and a half resume with fluff, I guess is the the best, best way to word it. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, A question for you, since you've probably been somewhat involved with applications or at least helping to recruit. um, If, if you guys post a, job opening for a graphic designer, whatever it may be, how important do you put someone's resume who is just esports tailored? Like, do you think people should include their other job experience just like you would to any other regular job? Or are you really just looking for a portfolio, for example, or just a resume with only esports related stuff? Like they were a player for this team and they were a coach for this team and so on yeah um i think it's um kind of case by case um at the end of the day i'm always looking for a portfolio if i'm looking for a designer uh portfolio is priority i don't even to be honest i don't even care about the cover letter at that point you could you know as long as you understand and speak english and have a phenomenal portfolio Mm -hmm. i'm happy to have you work with us um obviously i 
I do go back and look at the portfolio or the uh, resume or cover letter after just because it makes sense to. Um, but the, the priority in that situation is the portfolio. Um, and now it doesn't have to be esports. Um, I just, uh, there needs to be a way that you're portraying to me that you could design, um, you know, production files, tech packs, um, mock-ups, something that fits the esports space. It doesn't necessarily need to be what esports is right now. You don't need to be a sponge. Um, but you, you, uh, there needs to be some type of representation that you could do what I need you to do. Um, and that's on our side, you know, if we're looking for a graphic designer to do social media work and advertising, that's a little bit easier to kind of say, you know, I worked with, um, Doritos and I did this, this, and this for them. And, and, you know, we did all these advertising pieces. Um, you know, that's much more transitionable than Jersey design because, Esports jersey design is not something that's done in, in very many scenes. You know, if you're a paintball jersey designer, that might be one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, things like that. But as far as more, I guess, business and sales types position type of positions, um, at I, I really don't. I don't really like resumes in situations like this. Obviously, that's the way to get the conversation started. I would prefer to sit down face to face and interview all these people yeah. because I'm I have a pretty decent judge of character. I feel. Um, and I would, you know, I have a, a good gut feeling in most situations. Again, this is just me. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I don't, in that situation, it doesn't matter if it's esports or not. It's just what's relative to the position you're applying for. So if you're, if we're hiring for a sales rep, um, and you, and you want the position, I, I don't necessarily care if you were in you know, XYZ esports org for a year and a half because we're an esports based company. I'd rather hear that you were a used car salesman or that you, you know, flipped houses or things like that, like things that you're going to build um, or that I'm going to know you have skills that are going to fit the, my need make more sense to me there. Um, but again, you know, it's kind of it's all case by case at that point. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I'm uh, actually, I'm a, uh, Put you on the spot real quick because I'm curious. Oh boy. You don't have to answer this. <laughs> what out of any organization? Who do you? I, I, let me think out a word. This okay. What out of all the organizations? Who do you think has the best social media graphics? Oh, that's ah, oh, that is putting me on the spot because I'm kind of friendly with most of the guys. Um. Uh. Ooh. At Damn. least a couple, if you if you're telling me who you're deciding between. Um, I would say a hundred thieves is doing it phenomenal. Al- Alpaca is a phenomenal designer. I've I've been I've known him for for a while. He's he's always done some stellar work. Even when he was at Optic, he did great work too. Um, but I think where he's at now, he's doing really really good work with uh, you know, kind of bringing that brand to the light that it you know the the fan base wants to see. Yeah. Um, I think. I think George uh, Zob does a really good job at Optic, um, and and prior to moving over to Luminosity, um, Typo John Typo. I don't know if you know who he is. He he does some phenomenal work too. He does great work at LG also. But um, is that I, a, is that typographic? Typographic, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. He, I I haven't been able to follow his work as much as I did when he was at Optic and Infinite. But um, his work at Optic was phenomenal. Him and him and Zob do some killer work um and then um i don't know if you follow nrg at all but um gomi or yeah i just saw they got got didn't they get a rebranding yeah they rebranded about a month ago maybe two months at this point um i'm I'm late to noticing that then yeah yeah uh so gomi does a really good job there um i I think wasn't that much of a fan of their rebranding yeah um it was different I think the rebrand was, in my opinion, the rebrand was needed. I, I don't know if it's the way I would have done it, but at the same time, I don't know their fan base or you know yeah. what they're kind of trying to sell to. So I really can't speak on it. Um, but you know, I mentioned a few, but that's not to say that other teams aren't doing it right. I think those guys right. are the, the ones that are doing it, in my opinion, the of the best. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's there's tons and tons of organizations that are doing it you know, at, at the bar or, you know, above the bar. I mean, there's, there's also plenty of organizations that are just terrible. Um, right. but, and I won't I get like into for that. For the most part, <laughs> most of the top organizations at this point 
have their social media graphics and structure under control. There's a couple things that have passed by. I'm not sure how, like uh, some of Midnight stuff, but we don't <laughs> yeah. need to talk about that. Um, <laughs> yeah. I was going to say 100 Thieves as well. I'm kind of biased because yeah. that's my favorite organization, but um, Optics is always good. I, I like a lot of uh, Team Liquid's graphics. Yeah, Liquid does a really good job with their stuff too. I think the thing with Liquid that I think that they they're, uh, that they're doing right is um, ev- like everything that they do from a social media standpoint is done very, very well and it's structured and it makes sense. Like they put a lot of thought process and time into what they do, I think. Yeah. Um, and if you look at if you look at their Marvel drop, they did a really, really good job of like coordinating that. And if you look at Rift Rivals, um, I don't know if you I don't know if you watch League at all, yeah, but yeah. Uh, Rift Rivals this past this past Rift Rivals there and the one before too, they just they they just go so extra with it and it's just done so well. Um, and there's a lot you could tell there's a decent amount of planning involved in it. Um, and I don't know, I think I think they're doing it right too. Um, but yeah, that's Team more Liquid, than just. I would put a I would put them at the top as far as like overall they they maintain the same voice through all of their tweets like everything flows well their branding is amazing and I mean them and Hunter Thieves I put at the top Optics up there too I mean th- there's a lot of them but yeah. that's just who comes to my mind um which is a little bit biased Yeah, yeah same here yeah uh you know obviously obviously there's like I said I, I don't want it to seem like we're knocking anybody here because I'm sure you're not. And I know I'm not, but there's definitely tons of organizations that do it right. Um, but those are just a couple that stand out. Yeah. Next thing yeah. you know, I'm throwing you underneath the bus to all the oh, yeah. graphic designers. <laughs> that would, it wouldn't be good, but yeah, it's okay. I could take the heat. <laughs> um, yeah. So we, we didn't get into this too much. So you're, you are on the social media chair at um ohio state so what does that what does that mean for you what does your day-to-day look like as part of the social media team so i joined at the end of last year and i it was pretty close to the end of the school year so i haven't necessarily been like we haven't been too organized i would say because we are transitioning to the actual program there's a lot of stuff that we don't know and that we're figuring out as we go Mm -hmm. um but right before the transition started to happen. We did come up with our, you know, out outline of all the positions that were going to be filled within the club or the program. And underneath the public relations and diversity board, which is technically like a minor board in this hierarchy of positions, we have the social media chair. Uh, basically, I'm just in charge of running all of our social media accounts. We're really only focusing and working with Twitter at the moment. I know um, with the program taking over some things, I'm not sure what's shifting, but I've made the majority of the tweets over the summer and from since the end of the school year. Um, Some of the other like minor board members have also tweeted some stuff out, but we also, we've, we've made a lot of documents just trying to keep everything organized and analytical. So we have some spreadsheets going over, our impressions, our profile clicks, our um, replies, likes, retweets, all that stuff to see kind of what's working and what's not. But it's definitely a building process right now for esports, at least at Ohio State. Um, We're working to get more organized and established. And hopefully once school starts back up for us, which is later this week, actually, um, we'll get a better idea of how we fall into line with the actual program. So what do you what do you do to kind of track? Um, I'm going to get a little, I guess, picking into it a little bit deeper because I um, social media is. I mean, I think social media is the most important thing in a selling aspect. Whether you're um, an esports organization and you're an entertainment organization, or you're a esports apparel organization, social media is where you're going to get all your traffic. Whether you know it's eyes or sales or whatever. Yep. Um, so what do you do to kind of track to see what's effective and what's not effective? Like, obviously you go in and you see, wow, this tweet has three times the amount of impressions that it normally does. And it got us, you know, 50% extra uh, profile visits and however many followers. But what do you do to actually granularly figure out what is going to be, you know, 
um, better than the next tweet. And then ultimately, you know that a tweet is going to do well before you put it up type thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, it's not down to a specific science, but we just we take like the different elements of a tweet, whether or not there's any image attached to it, if there's a link attached to it, are we mm-hmm. using um, emojis? How are we even spacing out separate lines in a tweet or is it all one block paragraph just Uh kind of small stuff like that we started to see like not surprisingly if we post a tweet that has an image or a gif it usually does better no matter what the content is compared to tweets that just have nothing but words on them Um, if we engage with another organization or school or another team in our tweet that usually also draws more attention to the tweet. Um, So it's kind of just looking through and seeing if we see this tweet got, you know, three times the likes and retweets than this tweet. Well, why is that? Well, maybe it could be explained as, you know, this one's a GIF or this one's just a reply. It only got one favorite. Um, Mm -hmm. It's kind of basic stuff like that. It just, it might not be something that you think about Um, and obviously like we have a pretty good understanding. Um, we wrote up like a social media plan. We have a pretty good understanding of the best times to post on Twitter when we see the most engagement. Um, it's just like small things that a lot of people, unless they're trying to come up with a list of things that make a tweet successful or not, they don't really think about all these little things like when you should post and this, like if you should tab down a line or if you should just continue with multiple sentences or put bullet points or whatever it may be, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and the reason I wanted to try and get a little bit more granular is because social media has been a, a huge focus of ours the past probably 12 to 18 months. Um, and, you know, whereas prior to that, it was kind of more just like, hey, this is a jersey we did. And hey, this is a sale we're doing. And it's just kind of like stale. Mm-hmm. Um, or now it's like, you know, we, we spend um, we spend a, a good amount of time or an hour or so on, on a Monday and we plan out our day or our week um, for our social media posts across all platforms. Um, and we figure out what that looks like. And, you know, we, we, there's a lot more thought that goes into it versus just, oh, crap, I got to put up a tweet today or whatever right. it is. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, having that structure and, have, and having the understanding of your, your, your audience um, and what they like and what they don't like is super important. Um, so, yeah. you know, the, will, all the little things. Mm-hmm. I will say I, I didn't mention that. Um, I kind of took over it uh, for the most part a bad time because it's summer and nothing's really going on during summer for college esports because everyone's home and not on campus. So there hasn't been like much to tweet about once once the school year starts back up and our teams get their schedules and figure out when they have league matches and all that stuff. We do have a big calendar where we map out every time, every day there's an event, you know, if the rainbow six team is playing and we have it color coded down to if a match is being streamed or if it's not being streamed, where can you find the stream? What time the match is? And that makes it easier to coordinate with people in the social media chair because we know, okay, Wednesday there's going to be a, rocket league match we need to tweet out the stream if they're broadcasting it Mm -hmm. um so we do have some structure behind ours it's just like the the time at which i took over the account essentially it's yeah it's been pretty dry so i've basically just been trying to come up with memes and information (laughs) about ohio state's esports program and that's that's been the majority of our tweets this summer yeah, I mean that makes sense. Like you said, it's uh, it's kind of a dry period, so there's only so much you could do, especially if you don't have events to kind of hype up or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, so so what is um, hmm, I'm trying to think like spitballing like decent ideas of like filler. Actually, you probably don't even need more filler content. What it what if you did like breakdowns of the players? That would be kind of cool, I guess. That's just content to fill, get to know the players and stuff like that. Oh, you mean like as far as our tweets goes? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh yeah, that's that's definitely a good idea. That's something like when I I joined the esports club at Ohio State probably midway through last year. Um I've 
I've had a passion for esports my whole life, essentially. But I didn't know that we had a club until my junior year. Um, I started going to Ohio State my sophomore year. So I went like a whole year and a half without even realizing. So I just reached out to them and I was like, is there any positions that are open? Is there anything I can help with? And that was something that I had mentioned to them was making content around our teams. Right. Because because of the fact that we were a club, like there was nothing that organized or like we didn't have any videographers or anything who would be willing to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, But I had had some history with photography and I volunteered to do that. So I'm sure that's something that we still plan on doing. Um, but we are in the process of figuring out what our actual teams will be versus club teams or I guess second level teams. Um, and like for Overwatch, we're still not sure if we're going to have an A team and a B team underneath like the actual program or if there's just going to be one team. Um, it's kind of dependent on scholarships. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so what is, how many teams are actually on the, on the roster? Is that the right word? How many teams are like a, a part of the organization? Um, the, the official Ohio State program that's launching is, they've mentioned so far they're going to have four teams, one in League of Legends, one in Hearthstone, one in Rocket League, and... I want to say one in Rainbow Six. I can double check that. Yeah. Um, <coughs> voice crack. <laughs> but our club had a little bit more. We had a Call of Duty team and Fortnite players, but because of there being no real established Fortnite like league or anything at the college level, that's not going to be happening. And there is some kind of league organizers for call of duty in college, but there's not any that are like backed by the NCAA or anything. And me and I need to take a drink. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, the, uh, so as far as, hmm, I guess, so maybe not necessarily because they're a part of, um, Ohio state or anything like that, but what, what's your favorite esports to watch esport to watch? Um, that's a hard question. Yeah. Honestly, I would say I would say League of Legends, Mm -hmm. which is I grew up playing nothing but FPS games. I started on Halo 3, played COD competitively for a couple years. Um, And I've played COD for the most part every single year. Then I got into Overwatch and CSGO and Battle Royales. Um, It wasn't until a a little over a year ago my friends finally got me to try League of Legends and I got addicted to it. And then when Nate Shot started 100 Thieves and they got a LCS team, that's when I really started to pay attention. Um, and it took me a while to uh, actually playing League to understand it enough to watch it. But I mean, now I fully understand everything and I don't know what it is. It just feels like there's more on the line in every game of League mm-hmm. um, rather than Call of Duty. Like, I... I watched all of champs and that was definitely an amazing event to watch. But like, as far as the actual um, weekday matches, like when they had the regular season for the pro league, I never watched those. It just didn't really feel like there's anything on the line. Mm -hmm. Um, There's pretty much only the major tournaments. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I I would agree that league is probably my favorite esport to watch right now. Um, uh, I come from a, se- a very similar kind of upbringing in esports and gaming. Um, I my first game was Halo Two, like first real kind of competitive game, I guess. Uh, was Halo Two? Got into COD, and then both of those trickled up as each game came out. Um, I didn't play League until probably a year and a half ago, two years ago. Um, it's coming out here um, to to Texas and working with Infinite and like being involved with that. I figured it was only necessary to do. Um, you know, and and as I learned league, I was like, "Holy crap! I I wish I got involved and understood this more um, earlier because it's just so there's so much more to it. You're not just pointing. I mean, not that Call of Duty is just point and shoot. Um, I mean, it is definitely pretty basic. <laughs> at the- yeah, it it's basic. Uh, the understanding of it is pretty basic, but I mean, there is strategy to it. It's it's not right. just yeah, it's not brainless. 
Um, but but League, there's so much more thought to it. It's like a, a digital game of chess, but way more yeah. involved. There's like, it, so it's cool to watch. And it's just, there's just so much greater of a skill gap in League compared to Call of Duty because, yeah. I mean, there's hundreds and thousands of kids who have insane reaction time and can snap onto people left and right. Um, mm-hmm. And they're pub stars or whatever they may be. But of course, there is the whole knowing how to actually play competitively and rotate and play with the team and communication and all that. But someone can still do pretty well just solely off of gun skill. Yes. Yeah. While in league, you have to be mechanically sound as well as be super smart and be able to make like on point reactions and decisions on the go and all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that's why league is intriguing to me. I'm terrible at it. Um, I try to play every once in a while, but I am god awful at it. But it's definitely fun yeah, to watch. I mean, I'm, I'm not. I'm not good either. I'm like, I think I'm. I'm silver in ranked. So. Yeah. But it's just, it's still super fun for me to play. And even at silver, it still feels like I'm at least playing the game. Like the other person at least somewhat knows what they're doing, I feel like. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, hmm. I think. I had, uh, uh, sorry, oh, I had one more kind of thing to bring up. Go for um, it. Before we come to a conclusion here. So do you watch the self-made podcast with Nate Shot? See, oh man, I was super excited for it because I've always been a huge fan of Nate Shot. Um, I think he's doing a really good job. I just I just don't have the time. I try to do so many different things like right now and I'm, I'm for whatever reason, like I, I was really big into podcasts before, ironically enough, before I started this one. I was really big into listening to Gary V. I listened to all of Hector's episodes. Um, and I listened to the first um, like three of the Courage and Eight Shot show. And then the first self-made one. And then I'm just still just so far behind on them. Um, yeah. So I, I haven't I haven't listened to any of the recent ones. So no, unfortunately. But I do like it. All right. Well, um, luckily for me, my other job is I, I deliver pizzas. So I'm driving around all day and that's just what I do is I listen to podcasts, but I listen to the same people that you named Gary V and Hex and <clears throat> the hundred thieves podcast. But, um, on his last episode, he was talking with the Houston Rockets general manager, right. um, Daryl Morey, I think is his name. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting. He said, he was bringing up how we're not sure what the future of esports is going to look like. Um, and he was talking about how certain games won't be around in 20 years. And one of the games that he thinks will be around in 20 years is League of Legends. I was kind of curious to hear what you thought about that and if there's any other esports games or games that can be competitive that come to mind that you think could still be around in 20 years. You said Nate Shot said this? Uh, it was actually Daryl Moore who said this, oh, the okay. general manager of the Rockets. Um, ah, pfft. I don't know what's going to be around next year to be totally honest with you. Like I think I think the structure behind league allows it or gives it the chance to be around for 20 years. Um now if there isn't a League of Legends 2 or a uh, Riot doesn't come out with another game between now and then, I'd be super surprised. Um but I don't think that it would die. I I think it would definitely be, you know, done well because I mean the League of Legends that we see now is not the same League of Legends that was out when it fa- first came out seven or whatever, eight years ago, maybe. Um, so I, I think, you know, with the amount that they, as, as much kind of flack as they get about the balance team being terrible or whatever, they all the crap that they get all the time, I think they do a good job of keeping the game fresh. Like a right. month after I learned the game or uh, learned the game enough to queue in comfortably. Um, they added the turret plating. And I thought that was a really cool thing. And like now we have turret plating and it's like, what did we do before turret plating? And it just, there's all these little things that just make sense um, that they do and they keep the game fresh and then they keep the game like wanting people to come back and and things like that. Now, esports hasn't been around for 20 years, so it's kind of hard to see what a true life cycle of a game, whether it's a good game or a bad game is going to be. I think... I think MOBA, I think the MOBA genre will always be around. Um, whether it's Dota that lasts or it's League that lasts or, you know, it definitely won't be, in my opinion, it won't be Smite. Um, mm-hmm. 
But I think, I don't know. I think it'll be interesting to see. I think a game like Counter-Strike might be around. Um, again, they might make a new one. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think, I think Counter-Strike does as well as it does and League does as well as it does and Dota does as well as it does because it's the same game. They just fix it and they they make it fresh and they, they make new aspects to it or whatever it is. Um, I, as big of a Call of Duty, Halo, and Gears fan as I am and, and was for the longest time, those games, I think, just don't do as well because they change. They, you know, COD is a new game every year. Halo is a new game every two and a half to three. Uh, Gears is the same life cycle. It's, it's, I think that's where that issue, is, <clears throat> that issue is because, or that, you know, they don't, they're not, it's not the same game. They just rebuild it and then they have to focus on rebuilding the game and there's not fixes. There's just a rebuild and then they have to fix it and then they rebuild. And it's just like, there's no real progress in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts? I would agree with that for the most part. I I can definitely see League of Legends being there. Like you were kind of hesitant to even have a direct answer at the beginning. No one really knows just because yeah. how fast esports changes. I mean, Fortnite came out of nowhere and became the world's biggest esport in one year's time. So anything is possible as far as what game is going to take over what. Um, but I would agree the MOBAs are definitely more likely to continue to live on. Um, games like Call of Duty, I mean, honestly, I would have thought, I wouldn't have been surprised if a different FPS had taken over Call of Duty already, but it just keeps coming back year after year and keeps getting the player base, so it's kind of yeah. hard to say, really. I just... I think he- oh, go ahead, sorry. It's just, it's hard for me to picture so many of these COD veterans and so many of these young guys who grew up with Call of Duty all they know as as all they know to just switch over to a new FPS title, even if the game might actually be better. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I think, I think COD is doing it right. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens with this new game um, and the franchising, the way like the rumors are, um, you know, with everything going on. I think... Mm-hmm. I think it could be done right. I think if if Call of Duty switches to a, you know, a one game over the with either heavy updates every year or whatever, I think that could that could do really well for the franchise. Uh, obviously, it would it would hurt their their yearly holy crap um, revenue that they get every October, November, or September, October, whatever it is. Um, but outside of that, the the life cycle of the game would be just more valuable and like it'd be more interesting to watch and people would understand the game at a much higher level. Like look at people who play counter-strike people. There's, there's particular spots that you could stand in and throw a smoke grenade and get it all the way across the map based on the bounce it hits. And if you jump or not, like people know that stuff on these maps and in call of duty, you don't figure that stuff out until the end and you don't know where you could see the perfect sight line or, or wall bang a spot. It takes like a long, like a lot of time to figure that out. And, you know, just as the players are starting to get comfortable with the game and the maps, they're into a new game. And it's like, yeah. you learn it all over again. So it's, I don't know. I, I think it'll be interesting to see. I, I'm super, super, super curious to see what's going to happen in, you know, 20 years from now. And I'm, I'm hoping I'm still around to at some capacity. Right. Yeah. Also with like VR and AR and all oh, that, that too. stuff. We don't even know where it's going to be. Yeah. Um, that'll be, that'll be crazy. <laughs> that'd be absolutely but- crazy. With uh, the Call of Duty, like you were saying, how people just start to get used to the game by the end of the year, I think that's also part of the reason um, why it's pretty common for us to see, you know, teams bad at the beginning of the year really start to heat up at the end of the year. Yeah. Um, And obviously there's your teams that are good throughout the year, but it's kind of unfortunate that right as a team can get hot, it's already a new game, and it's like they're resetting down to level one um because i mean not even well i guess it's about a full year pretty much a full year is all they have to learn everything and reach their best peak performance and it's it's almost to a point where it's like all right well the people who can catch on the fastest have the biggest advantage going into a call of duty rather than Mm -hmm. the people who are actually the best like when they get to that prime point yeah yeah that's why yeah, that's a uh, man. I, I haven't really thought about it like this in a while. But yeah, it like Call of Duty can be so fluky. I mean, look at look at what happened with what was it EG that won last year's champs? 
Yeah. That roster, I believe, during the offseason was sold to Envy, if I remember correctly. Um, I could be wrong. But then that team, I don't remember that team ever placing very, very well. And then I think they broke up or moved uh, rosters around. But then, um, you know, Optic did well, first or second event or whatever. And then 100 Thieves did well, two events in a row. And then E United came out of nowhere. Like, you know, they... They contended the whole year. They were in the pro league and all that, but I don't know if anybody actually had them slated to win before Miami. And they right. go and win Miami and champs two games in a row. And then what's going to happen to them when the next you know, event comes around when the new game's out? Mm-hmm. Then what? Like it's going to be weird to see. Like are they going to start from zero or are they going to still have this hype? But in reality, everybody starts from zero, so it's it's going to be weird to see. Well, yeah, and and basically every team is, I would assume, pretty much getting reset. I don't know exactly how it's going to work with uh, franchising coming into play mm-hmm. but um i did i don't did you see what they've like announced so far about the franchising and like how they plan on doing it uh bits and pieces i did you hear about the 28 team thing 28 teams isn't that uh, isn't that 28 teams like what they want to ultimately be at yeah yeah like long term yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of like what, um, kind of like how Overwatch League was. Like they announced that they wanted to have as many teams as they did, and they only had twelve or in the beginning or whatever. So I'm, I'm sure Call of Duty will have a, a fraction of twenty eight to start. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think they said they were starting. I want to say with eight or twelve, probably twelve. I would assume, but um, twelve makes sense. When I saw they were going to get twenty eight, I actually like became super excited because I think if it gets to a point where it's kind of like the NFL and there's that many teams that would be like super fun to watch and it would introduce a lot of new players to the scenes and probably end up shaking up, you know, top rosters. Yeah. If it were to go to 28 teams. Well, it'd be super interesting. I've seen this, um, since between now, since like yesterday, I think it was when I saw it recently. And when they first announced it, um, there's this idea that there, there might be a draft. I think it'd be super cool. Like it would suck. Chemistry would be terrible. Yeah. Um, and players, Call of Duty players are very dramatic. Right. I think is the right word. Um, but um, I would be super interested to see, like you know, a, like a whole draft of the entire pool. Um, it'd be really weird to see because it strategically you would pick, you know, your your the best sub available and the best AR available and the best sub that runs X, Y, and Z available. Like you know, I think. It'd be obviously such a different take, um, and then trades would happen just like anything else. But it'd be it'd be super interesting to see. Um, yeah, I forget who it was, but I saw someone uh, on Twitter saying they're going to make a mock draft and put all yeah. the pro players. I'd actually that'd be fun to see. Um, and something else this is just a super random thing I just thought of, which I kind of wish they implemented more into like the franchise season. I wish they would do like like a fun non-competitive event or at least some like show matches or something like combining like an all-star type game or I think they need to do more with like influencers or big content creators like Fortnite does and that would really help the scene grow. Yeah, I would I would well actually I haven't seen too much of that in Overwatch, but I would assume that there's there will be stuff like that based on the fact that franchising is coming around or at least more like activation and, and like fun things. Yeah. But again, actually I don't, I can't aside from like the, the stuff that the organizations ran and the teams ran. Um, I don't really remember that there being too many like overwatch activations aside from the actual events. Mm-hmm. Well, there was like the homestand and I guess those things. Yeah. Um, but look at like rift rivals and league or, you know, the show matches that you have in counter strike where the casters get on and play. They, I mean, they yeah. even do that in two. Um, but there are, I mean, there's a ton of fun things you could do. But at the same time, there's a lot of people that if you get in those chats, people are just, they say it's cringy. So it kind of depends on who the audience is and like yeah. who's actually interested in it. I don't, yeah, speaking as somebody who sees it, it's, it's funny to watch somebody who is clearly a professional and clearly not a professional play on the same team because it's, right. you know, chemistry is not there and people get absolutely destroyed and it's fun to watch. I like it. So, I mean, just someone tell me, who who would not want Doc disrespect in a oh, hell yeah. match of Call of Duty? Everybody, oh, hell yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that'd, that'd be great. Uh, I'll you have know, uh, his people call call their people, and, and maybe we'll figure something out. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to get some VIP access to the black on black on slate black. Yeah, room. that'd be cool. Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, that, that kind of probably winds it down. I mean, we went going for about an hour here, so uh, don't want to keep you too long here. Um, of course. But uh, hmm. so to wind it down, I guess, do you have any um, do you have anything that you didn't get to say that you wanted to say? Um, uh, we, pretty much, we pretty much covered the couple points I had listed down. Cool. Um, I'm sure I forgot some things that I was going to say. Yeah. Uh, That's okay. But yeah, for the most part, we covered everything. Congratulations to United. And, yeah, uh, yes, really. Simp is absolutely a madman. Yeah, he's disgusting. <laughs> out of it's out unfair. of Optic Hunter Thieves and, and United, I definitely wanted United to win the least, but I'm happy for Clayster and Simp is the best player in the game, so they yeah. deserve it. Yeah, I agree. I've been I've been pulling for Clay for a while, so I was happy to see him win. Um Yeah, uh other than that, um Shameless plugs. Um, of I don't know. Course, the shameless. Plug. I don't know what you want to plug. So go ahead and and tell the people where where they could find you if they want to talk to you more. We'll just plug my Twitter at mm-hmm. itz underscore ritzy r i t z y. Um, that's what I use. I don't. I have streamed sometimes, but not <laughs> right now. So yeah. pretty much just find me at Twitter if you ever want to talk. If you guys want to do a podcast um this is actually the first podcast that i've done but yeah i've been super interested in either joining other people's podcasts or starting my own so it was definitely good, you, to, good to talk with you i'll tell you if you're interested in it and you could put a get together a list of like what makes sense to you and something you're interested in talking about just do it it yeah like this takes an hour out of my day i go edit it it takes me 15 minutes i put it up and you know worst case scenario you know, you talk to cool people and not a lot of people listen to it, but at the end of the day, you're still talking to cool people and you're still like doing things. So, you know, it's, it's fun. I would, I would definitely recommend doing it. The startup cost isn't too much. So definitely look into it. Um, but yeah, other than that, um, I'll have his Twitter linked in the YouTube description. If you're listening on YouTube, if you're listening on anything else, if it's audio only, whatever it is, make sure to leave a like, follow, comment, subscribe whatever it is um and let me know how this one was um other than that i will catch you guys in the next one see you later